This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Patrick Gulo. I'm David McDonald. I'm Sam Merciers. And I'm Nate Blyton. And our guest this week is conductor Verena Mosenbickler Bryant. She's the director of the Duke University Wind Symphony and executive director of the World Youth Wind Orchestra Project and serves frequently as guest conductor and clinician throughout the U.S. and her native Austria. She has studied conducting with titans of the band world, Jerry Junkin and Kevin Sedatal, go MSU, and has transcribed works by John Crigliano and Stephen Bryant, her husband. Raina, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Um, Verena, in addition to having you on the show because you're an engaging uh, conductor involved in new music and, and the music world generally, this is a long time coming response to uh, some controversial things that were in the media um, beginning in the, at the end of August. Um, and I don't want to spend too much time harping on this, but to just, just, just to give some people some context, because it's been a while since this all went down. Um, at the end of August in 2013, uh, this is the one that everyone knows about. Uh, Vasily Petrenko, who is the conductor of the uh, Royal Liverpool Philharmonic, and that, that is an open-ended contract now, and also was just in 2013 uh, named... Uh, I think it was just for the 2013-14 season as the music director of the Oslo Philharmonic, um, was asked about his opinion on female conductors, and he said some pretty asinine things, uh, the highlights of which are um, – asked about female conductors, he said, uh, often uh, male conductors have less sexual energy and therefore can focus more on the music, whatever that means. And further went on to explain, a sweet girl on the podium can make one's thoughts drift towards something else. Um, when women have, and also when women have families, it is difficult to be as dedicated as is required in this business. Um, so I think we'll start there. Some other people <laughs> said some other stupid things, and we'll get to those later. Um, so, so Verena, tell us how you feel be, being at such a huge disadvantage because of your gender <laughs> as a conductor. Tell us what you think about uh, if you have any thoughts on these statements. You know, I'm 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 sad that we still are in a world where gender is seen as an issue. Um, you know, I I having the accusation that having sexual energy on the podium and uh, that we are not as dedicated to the business, I think are just old accusations. And uh, there are several women out there in the orchestral world, in the conductor's world, that have made ex very successful appearances and have proven the world differently. You know, I'm actually happy that they are speaking up and making foolish comments about female conductors because it draws attention to us. And I think it actually opens some doors for us and... I think the world knows now that, you know, there are still people out there that think that women can't be conductors and or be in, like, leading positions. Um, right. What was very interesting to me is, if like, Petrenko, he is in his late 30s. He's only 37. And yeah. the director of the Paris Conservatory, who also made some accusations, Bruno Mantovani, he mm -hmm. is 39. Um, yeah, so these aren't just old guys that are no, cranky. No, they're like my generation, which, yeah. you know, like Tamikanov, also Russian, um, he is 75, and he had some very strong opinions about female conductors. And I kind of can, can you know, they, they, he grew up in a different generation. Yes, he actually said the most, the most offensive thing in and of itself the essence of the conductor's profession is strength the essence of a woman is weakness is the quote the pull quote from <laughs> from him but like you said he is 75 but you know i'm older than these two guys well uh, and, and ross i would say alex ross describes him in in that he was the one that kind of gave that translation in english for the first time i think uh when right. he wrote about it and he he wrote that um that guy uh was kind of a mentor to both Gergiev and Petrenko, mm -hmm. who are some of the sources of these other comments. So there right. may be some relationship there as well. 
Um, yep. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, well, given the situation, I had a, a couple of questions. Verity, you're you might be in a in a particularly uh, good position to answer one of my questions, having to do with the differences in the way these attitudes are in the United States versus Europe, and to give some context, I mean. You, I have a, uh, an idea about the way it might be based on a couple of facts, such as the Berlin Philharmonic did not admit any female players until 1982, and Vienna not until 1997, Yeah, which is just unbelievable. And this year, well, 2013, Marin Alsop directed the uh, last night of the proms, and that's the first time a woman has ever done so. So do you have any thoughts or insights being the, uh, you know, uh, being originally from Austria, and I know you visit there often, um, about the way these attitudes might differ between Europe and the United States? You know, in the ensembles I've worked with in, in Europe, uh, they have been very open to female conductors. I mean, there's always at the first rehearsal that like, oh, you're a woman. But then by the end of the rehearsal, it, it doesn't matter anymore. Now, in the professional world, I think it's still a different story. Um, as you mentioned, you know, Vienna Philharmonic not opening the doors for females until 1997, uh, they're way behind. And I, I can't wait for the day until a female conductor conducts the um, New Year's concert, the famous New Year's concert. I think it'll still take a while, and, but hopefully one day we'll make it. Um, but there's definitely still, I, th I think Europe um, is still not as open as the U.S. is. Hmm. Do, you th do you feel it's different in, uh, throughout the band world as opposed to the orchestra world? Um, I, I think there's a difference between the professional world and then the educational university high school world. Uh, I think it, it, in the U.S. it's not a problem anymore in the university and educational world at all. Uh, I, I still, you know, there, there's still very few women uh, that have made it to the very top in the orchestral world. But we are the the it's growing day by day. Mm. Um, in in Europe, there are not as many positions as in the U.S., I mean, due to its size. Um, and very few women actually have made, made a very successful career on the professional rep, uh, level. Uh, the educational system is so different in Austria, but I, I, a lot of females are working in the educational university world in, in Europe. Yeah. But it's interesting. It's, it's, it's like... Um, the, the stories really focus on the conductor as in the huge big name um, conductor, the Michael Tilson Thomas kind of conductor, you know, right. and in that world and several of the pieces make the point that that is still equated with like male power, you know? Um, and just from a practical point of view, I'm very, and everybody on the panel is very interested in new music. Um, even the idea of, of new ideas, even conducting older pieces, and, and humanity at, at large, I think, discounts itself if we don't assume that even if women might have a tendency to do something differently, that it's not as good or something like that. Right. Um, it's, a, it's a new perspective. Um, and I think it, we have to be careful about these attitudes slipping by without being noticed. As an example, the piece in The Guardian that we'll have a link to um, by... Uh, Bimke Clay Colborn um, is a piece condemning Petrenko for what he said, but goes on to say um, part of the problem is that female conductors aren't as good as male conductors because they haven't had as much opportunity to practice, which <laughs> to me seems ridiculous um, because you – if you go to school to become a conductor, you get just as much opportunity as anyone else, you know, and the, the opportunities are there for you to make for yourself. It just seems like a a weird backpedaling kind of statement to make in an article that's supposed to be condemning someone who has archaic attitudes about women in that field. Right. 
Um, so, do you, so do you feel like the, I mean, upon starting a conducting career or learning conducting, do you feel it is an even slate when you're at the university level, uh, or sorry, a blank slate, or um, you know, at, at everything being equal between men and women, um, but then the problems arise as you you know graduate and go throughout your career. Is that where initially you'd say it stems? I, I would I would say so because like in in my conducting education there was no gender there were no gender issues whatsoever like nothing from my colleagues nothing from my teachers uh everyone was very supportive um when you then enter the real world and i think it's more again more in the professional orchestra world than it is in the educational university world um i think that's when you see the problems and it has so much to do with who you know and um all about connections and you know sometimes it doesn't matter if you're good or not good it depends on who you know and who can help you and right speaking of who you know who, who like just getting ahead in the industry did uh, this is a um a, a digression but do you guys see that they're making a, a pilot for Mozart in the jungle <laughs> yeah it's Amazon's doing it yeah uh, yeah I thought that was interesting I did not I see that. I don't know anything about that. We, are we, did we not mention that on the show? <laughs> I don't know. We may have mentioned it. Um, no, so you mentioned, uh, Verena, the, the difference between the, the educational world and the professional world. And Sam described some of the things we've talked about before with regard to women playing in the orchestras and i wonder if there's a difference between or what you perceive as a difference between being the conductor which is a very visibly in charge position compared to playing in the orchestra and we've talked about uh issues regarding uh women and minorities as composers as well and i, I to me it, there's at least a, a visual difference and i think that is a lot of it is that it looks different. Um, but if, it, if you're a composer, if, unless somebody's reading the program, or if you have an androgynous first name or something, nobody would know if you were a, a man or a woman or what, what your ethnic or racial background is just based on looking at your name. I mean, they may have some ideas. But being the conductor is standing in front of 100 people and and telling them what to do and i think that it may, might be the source of a lot of this do you think that's a that, that that makes it different for women going into conducting as opposed to women going into other parts of music performance um uh, yes um i think you know the, be, being in a leadership role it doesn't matter what leadership role you're in i you're in a very vulnerable position and you have to be very strong in that position and if it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman i think if you show a sign of weakness there is always a way to you know to uh challenge you if if you show that weakness um you know as a female conductor i think it is really important that you embrace that you are a woman uh, I think a lot of female conductors or the way we are taught because a lot of our mentors are male um, are trying to teach you to be, become a male conductor. Um, mm. Embracing that you are a female and that you as a female move differently than males do, I think, uh, is very important. You know, I, I try to show my femininity on the podium by wearing sparkles. Uh, like sparkly outfits, but then I'm also very aware of um, that the audience is there and I'm the focus for the audience and they're seeing me from behind and I just wear long jackets. You know, that's interesting that uh, like in the United States, in the business world, there was a lot of talk in the 1980s when business was booming and it was all about, you know, corporate takeover and this kind of thing. But a lot of women were entering the business world and the criticism, cultural criticism would have been that women were either forced or kind of expected to become more masculine in order to succeed. And we've seen in the business world that that has changed. You know, there's lots of women CEOs these days that in the, uh, can't Dave help me out the Google, uh, uh, you're talking about uh, Yahoo, Marissa Meyer. 
Yeah. And when you see her, she's very much a woman, you know? And I think that's the model that we're seeing now. It's like, What do you mean very much a woman? What the hell is that? <laughs> she, she doesn't try to portray herself in any kind of masculine way. Oh, um, she's not wearing like big, big shoulder suits. Yeah, shoulder pads. That's the, I was getting to that. That was sort of the <laughs> symbol of yeah, men right. trying to be like women so that they can have business success. You know, they wear the shoulder pads to give themselves the broad shoulders. And uh, that's not the case anymore. But think, conducting think, is such um, a traditionally grounded field, it seems like it's a little harder to get things to move in that field. And it's interesting that, you know, we see few female conductors, but we see lots of female principal violinists. Right. And well, it's almost – go ahead. I think blind auditions really helped for females mm -hmm. in the orchestral world. I wish we could do blind audition for conductors. Yeah, I don't know how that would work. Like, <laughs> that that yeah. would I that's, a, that's your next technological sense. problem to solve, Nate. Exactly. How do you? <laughs> yeah, that right. way you have how to do you watch it? somebody without actually seeing them? The, yeah. <laughs> well, the, the orchestra would have to be able to see see her, but you'd have to put like electrodes and sensors all It'd over. You'd be like a body. robot. You need like there a. You go. a, a uh, some kind of like avatar robot thing. Yeah, avatar. Do that, exactly. do, that, do that motion capture thing like they did with Smeagol, you know? Yeah, so you have to, when you go to audition, you just wear a suit with green ping pong balls all over it. <laughs> Problem solved. I can't have, uh, I can't. Next. Right. I, have to, I have to call, I have to, uh, you have to call your broker I have to, I know. and invest in some, a company <laughs> I just invented. I have to draw the line at Smeagol. I can't have Smeagol <laughs> conducting. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Well, see, then you would render, you would take that data and render it out into what they call in the TV show community the human being, the the genderless, skin-colored thing that is their mascot. You know. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I didn't know that. <laughs> I'm a little curious, actually. Like uh, a couple times in earlier episodes of the show, we've talked about just like kind of the classical music uniform as it is as a thing, and like even like musicians in an orchestra, like. The men not wearing a tux. That's like a thing. And well, we so should I want... talk now about the Baltimore Symphony then. And it's fabulous conductor, Marin also. Uh, because I... they're doing that, uh, that, that the initiative. Experiment, yeah, yeah, with yeah. Uh, Parsons. Right. School of Design. Yeah, it's, well, well Verena, you mentioned that you, you wear sparkles, you know, and... and <laughs> I'm ki I'm kidding when I say this, but you know, men get no breaks in the orchestra. I've played plenty of <laughs> in, in, in my education. I played lots of orchestra gigs, and uh, you know, the guys are all wearing tuxes or a black suit that's been modified to look like a tux. But women get to wear just about anything as long as it's black, um, which. You know, that's, that's not fair. No, I'm kidding. It's, oh, it's, the world it's, is so easy for women. It is yeah, exactly. so easy. But I it's mean, interesting <laughs> that that. You know, and that, that seems to be something that is an advantage and a disadvantage. If someone is very uh, immersed in the tradition, they're wanting to see a guy up there and they want to see tails coming off the back of him. And, you know, they want to see that uniform. And whereas women could be wearing some kind of a black suit or could be wearing a dress or could be, you know, the options are wide open uh, for women, it seems like, to a certain yeah. level. And that might be one of the things that people actually have an issue with. You know, I want to see I want to see the monkey suit that I'm used to seeing up there. I don't want to see this, you know, these sparkles or this whatever. I mean, but at, in terms of like actually just being there for a performance and putting on a show, sparkles make sense. Yeah, <laughs> I think. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Like being up there, being up front, it's something. Yeah, it's a live performance. You got to. Yeah. yeah. So, so how do you make those kinds of decisions, Verena? It's, as, as clearly there are a lot of people that have a lot of opinions about it. Right. Do you have a so does the Duke University Wind Symphony have a dress code for the concerts? Uh, we do still tuxes and black suits, uh, but I'm you know I'm always open to something new, and I'm thinking about things of changing it uh, depending on what repertoire we are playing. Um, you know, we did a Star Wars concert, and I wore a Darth Vader outfit. Cool. Oh, really? <laughs> awesome. <laughs> do we? Have, do you have pictures of that? I don't. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, no, you're a liar. Okay. You're a I, bet liar. Some students, I bet some students. Yeah, I was gonna say, just just do a little do a little Facebook search. There's got to be something. <laughs> but you know, it's interesting. Um, 
I was in Japan guest conducting and um, one of the audience members, elderly audience member, came up to me after the concert and told me, you really need to cut your hair. It's flowing around too much and you need to look more like a male. Like, okay, oh. thanks, but no thanks. Yeah, right. Wow. <laughs> um, that is amazing. Um, you know, there's another angle to this. And we should ask Drew, uh, actually, Drew McManus, because I'm not sure anyone will know, but um, getting around to like Bruno uh, Montovani, Montovani, the director, uh, he's a composer and conductor and director of the Paris Conservatory, who made some pretty asinine statements. Um, he's the one who said sometimes women are uh, dissuaded by the very physical aspects of conducting, taking a plane or, or conducting, then taking a plane and taking another plane. In other words, saying women just don't have the the uh, the stamina. Yeah to pull, pull off a, the life of the conductor. Um, so that's bad in and of itself that someone would have such a silly uh, opinion, but also because he is the director of the conservatory where presumably many women are going to school and the guy that is in charge of that school has this attitude. Um, it makes me wonder uh, in orchestra organizations, how do women uh, fare or parody in administration positions with orchestras. Um, I know that in all the stories we've done, whenever we're filtering through names and talking about this person and that person negotiating with this orchestra and that orchestra when they have uh, labor problems, I don't remember reading many, if any, female names. Dave, do you remember? Do, reading where? And when we're talking about orchestras having labor issues, which we've done quite oh, yeah. a bit, we're always talking about uh, the negotiating committees. The negotiating committees, and I don't remember very many, if any, female names included in that. In other words, well, again, those are leadership positions, not just leadership positions in the the musical system of the orchestra, but in the music musicians' union locals and in the boards. I, you know, there there are, I there are occasionally uh, uh, I see occasionally women's names pop up in the board. Of, mm -hmm. of an orchestra, but I don't remember seeing one on the negotiating committee. I and that's just my memory could be failing me. Yeah, what I what I was getting at is we, I don't know, but anecdotally, based on what we've experienced in covering labor disputes, there doesn't seem to be a lot of females involved in the administration aspect of orchestras. Um, we should ask Drew if he knows any has any information about that. Um, so do we feel this? This um, this is happening, um, you know, between men and, and women. Uh, do we feel this way about the composition world too? What, what do you mean? Um, well, I mean, like, are are men given preference in in composition? I mean, uh, you know, probably still because you know you do see a lot of works by by living male composers. Like I'm talking about living composers. Um, but you know that I think it certainly is changing, and even but even in school, I I mean I feel that. There are far more male conduct uh, male co composers in school than there were female composers. I think there are more concerted efforts to fix that in composition than there probably are in in conducting. But I mean, you're absolutely right. I you, just yesterday I went to uh, a meeting of the Central Florida Composers Forum. There were fifteen or twenty composers in the room, and there were two women. Yeah, everybody mm -hmm. else. Uh, all every, the it was two women and fifteen guys. Um, yeah. So I I don't know how quickly it's changing, but I feel like I see more uh, attention given to supporting female composers than conductors. There's also I think one of the one of the real challenges with getting any new group of people into conducting as opposed to composing is that there's a lot less turnover in conducting jobs, right? And yeah. you write a piece and the one person plays that piece, then you play the next piece by a different person. And so like there's a turnover of eight people on one concert, but conducting, you know, I, I don't know how, how, how long people tend to stay in university jobs. I think usually quite a while, especially at the level of Duke university, but <laughs> Even in even in professional orchestras, we have people that were the conductors of orchestras. You know, people like George Schwartz in Seattle was there for forty years or something. Um, right. So there's just it's it's not 
feasible in the way that the the institutions are set up to make any kind of change on that scale, at least a demographic change in in the people kinds of people that are holding those positions. So it was like twenty five years in Seattle. Uh, well, you know, I'm exaggerating. Okay. <laughs> it was a long time, right? It was a while. Yeah, that's a long for a music director. Long time. I mean, even when you when you get to ten years, that's a long time too. Right. You know, but uh, Robert so, Spano. So, Verena, been... you were probably just waiting. You I mean you were just had to look for somebody to retire, basically, right? I was lucky with Duke. I mean, there were only two job openings I was interested in when I graduated from UT um, because I I am not qualified to do marching band because of my Austrian background, and we really don't have marching bands like you do here in the U.S. And so the I Texas didn't. thing didn't clear that up. <laughs> They well, love their marching band yeah, that's down like, there. Yeah. That's like a doctorate in six months in Texas. <laughs> I just didn't feel like I, 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 I'm, I was ready to teach it. And I, I enjoyed the conducting on right. the podium. Uh, so I was looking for jobs. And Duke came up and it worked out. I, Duke actually had several, had a couple of women before me. Uh, so... It it was nothing new for them to have a female in a position. You know, one thing I, that always concerns me when we have this conversation, whether it's it's we're talking about performers or composers or conductors, and, and bringing women and minorities and making them a bigger part of the the musical community and the new music community in particular, is that we lose the focus on the thing that they do, and when we look at the people writing about this issue, some of the brushback against focus, and this is very backing off. We're now having a meta conversation about the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I'm always concerned that we are not talking about the composer's music, but rather their demographic profile. And I wonder if that's something that, that, concerns anybody else in this conversation that you know we've been talking to a conductor of a major <laughs> university's wind symphony for 20 30 minutes now and we, we we haven't really talked much about the kinds of things that she does at duke um and i i, I understand that that's important that it's important to talk about these other things and that we shouldn't ignore them but there i think is a counterproductive Point, there's a there's a point of diminishing returns, right? Where we're we're focusing on this thing, and now treating them as a a separate group, and that's some of the the pushback. I I want to say, I don't want to put a name on it because I'm going to get it wrong, but I know I've read columns to that effect on New Music Box and other places with regard to composers. Brenda, do you ever feel like we're we're you know focusing too much on this this one? small part of what it is that you do and ignoring the, the main thrust of your job as a conductor and <laughs> teacher at Duke. Yes. And that's why I'm not too concerned about these accusations. You know, uh, they'll, they'll pass and, and women will be in leading conducting positions. Uh, I'm sure, it, you know, in this next generation, it won't be a concern. Um, you know, it's it's interesting because like mine also she is considered the best female conductor. It's like mm -hmm. why do we still have to name it the best female conductor? Why can't we just say she's one of the top conductors in the world? Um, you know the the biggest thing is we our job as a conductor is to bring the music alive and and to focus on the music and uh, talking about these issues. We are not talking about music. So I, I I don't think I hear people say that like just say words like to the effect of Marin Alsop is the best female conductor. I might hear something like along the lines of she's the most visible female conductor. Well, I think you hear both. I mean, she does get referenced in a lot of other. There's not not and let's point out she's not the only like big female conductor out there. But to me, the the the, the cruel crux of the issue is that when this kind of thing gets media attention. It's addressed from top down, and the possible solution to the problem is addressed in a top down way. And the real solution to in a problem such as this is a bottom up solution. You know, you're not going to shame people into changing their attitudes 
very much by covering it on a blog or covering it on a podcast. But when you work to encourage female composers and conductors and musicians to um, have a lot of uh, advocacy for themselves and to strive for certain positions starting in the younger education area moving forward, that's the solution. But it's hard to talk about a bottom-up solution in a you know a media format such as this because – I don't know. It's, it's there's slow. nothing. To, it's slow, <laughs> so it doesn't make good headlines. <laughs> so, yes. So on that note, Verena, tell us about some of the awesome projects you're doing as a conductor coming up soon. So I also teach at UNC School of the Arts. I started mm-hmm. there uh, in the fall, and I just conduct uh, the wind ensemble, and it's in Winston Salem. And uh, we have two upcoming concerts. One is actually next Friday. Uh, we are doing selection from the planets. With, uh, we are doing uh, Children's March. We are doing um, Festmusik der Stadt Wien. Are you going to um, wear an astronaut's outfit? <laughs> no, sorry. <All> right. <laughs> <laughs> we're doing Kingfishers Catch Fire. And then... We're, I'm doing another concert with them in April, and we're doing Joel Puckett's Flute Concerto, uh, which is a very big work by Joel Puckett. Uh, and then with Duke, um, we have two concerts uh, coming up. Uh, one we're going to share with the Durham Community Concert Band. And uh, our second concert, uh, we actually commissioned David Garner, who is a Duke composer, uh, to write a saxophone concerto for us, uh, for a soprano sax. And Susan Fancher, she's going to do, do the premiere of it with us. Um, and I'm an advocate of composers, obviously being married to one. <laughs> uh, so on, on this concert with the Wind Symphony, we're doing a new piece by Paul Leary. Uh, he is uh, adjunct faculty or visiting professor at Duke this year in composition and theory. So um, two new works coming up, and then um, I also conducted Duke Medicine Orchestra, and we're doing Bernstein, uh, Candide, um, we're doing Star Wars, and we're doing Selection of the Planets in May. Um, in the summer, I have three big projects. Um, I'll be in Strasbourg in France um, to work with the uh, conservatory there and then I'm gonna do a project in Austria uh, it's a week-long project with like local music school directors and um, teachers uh, in uh, Tyrol and then we have a big music festival the mid Europe festival and I, I am the executive director of the World Youth Wind Orchestra project for that it's a group of 65 musicians that come from all over the world. Uh, Kevin Sedatol uh, will be our guest conductor. Joe Lulov will come to premiere um, Stephen's saxophone concerto. Um, and then we have a couple of other conductors, and I'll conduct, of, of course. Yeah, Stephen was in uh, Lansing just recently working with Joe on saxophone parts or something, wasn't he? And Joe was actually here just oh, okay. last week. Yeah. Cool. Okay. That's the 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 Facebook told me that. <laughs> exactly. The, the Facebook dot com. The Facebook. I, I have yeah. a I have a question, and I apologize if this if 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 we've already discussed this, but Verena, how did you, as an Austrian musician, get into wind conducting? That I, doesn't yeah. seem that doesn't those <laughs> those seem incongruous to me. I grew up in the wind ensemble world. Uh, really? My dad is a conductor, and he taught our lo- local community band. And so I grew up in the community band. I played flute and bassoon in it. And uh, then I started conducting when I was 16. I found patterns laying around the house, and I was like, huh, oh, I, I, I want to learn more about it. And so I actually started with my dad. And then... Um, when it came to make a decision of where my career should go, uh, I did not want to study anymore with my dad. I wanted something new. And <laughs> so I um, did my undergrad in orchestral conducting. Uh, Ray Kramer is a very dear friend of the family, and he taught at Indiana, and he came over to our festival several times, and I conducted for him. And he's like, well, you should, you should come to the U.S., uh, the problem we had in Austria, we did not really have any podium time. Um, so I was 
I was eager for some podium time. Um, and so he suggested you should really apply in the US. And I applied to Michigan State and John Whitwell accepted me. And yeah, so I'm, I'm back to where, where I grew up with the Wind Ensemble world. And I also, I love conducting both. I love conducting the orchestra. I love conducting Wind Ensembles. Well, the thing that surprised me was that you, that coming from Austria, that you, you wouldn't be a, a, an orchestra conductor. Yeah. Right. So that it's cool that, that I, like, I don't know if I've ever played in a, a, a wind band that was conducted <laughs> by anyone other than, well, by, certainly not by anyone that was, was European. Yeah, the, me neither. Are you, I've played in a lot of orchestras with European conductors, but and and I've and I've even sung in choirs that have European conductors, but uh, not wind band. That's so. That's what I what I think is interesting. Um, should we? Is there anything we should cover before we move into our our news stories? I was oh. just going to mention quickly that it seems like you get a lot more opportunity to play new music conducting wind ensembles than you would conducting orchestras. <laughs> We are eager for new music. I mean, our repertoire compared to the orchestral repertoire is so new, uh, and and our repertoire is growing daily. And it, you know, you, you can talk to any wind ensemble conductor. We we want new music. We we are eager for new music. Um, we want to build our repertoire. You heard it here first. Send her your scores. <laughs> <laughs> yes, do. I, I did want to point out a couple of blogs that I thought were interesting. Uh, Jessica Dutton's blog uh, from last September, she wrote about fanfare for the uncommon woman conductor. Uh, and she actually has a list of 100 female conductors that are in the professional orchestral world. Right. So that's something to check out. And um, talking about composer, Christy Custer actually uh, wrote about her position um, as a female composer in, in her blog, and it's called Taking Off My Pants. So I, I, <laughs> that's something to check out. And the other thing for female conductors, um, the Taki Concordia Conducting Fellowship that uh, Marin Alsop is basically in charge of, um, it's something to look into for women. Okay. All right. Yeah, we'll, I'm we'll going to have a link. Those things. I'm going to have a link, a uh, link to the uh, Jessica D Duchin uh, piece, and there's also a piece that was published on um, WQXR's blog that highlights like what they call the top five women female or female conductors on the rise. Mm -hmm. So we'll have links to all that. We'll have lots and lots of links. All right, I like and links. Spe speaking of women, <laughs> um, I see what you did there. The Super Bowl this year. You know what I would like to see is an opera singer on a global broadcast, right? That nationally broadcast in the United States on on perhaps the single most watched telecast of the year. You think we yeah. could arrange for that to happen? Uh, well, <laughs> Renee Fleming is is going to sing the national anthem at the Super Bowl this year, um, and it, it should be pointed out that having opera singers sing the national anthem in some contexts is not extremely rare, but this I'm not sure if this is the first time it's ever happened at the Super Bowl, but it very well could be, and I know it's, it hasn't happened. If it has happened before, it hasn't happened any time recently. So some national exposure for a... Uh, I, I don't think it's ever happened. I don't think that we have ever had an opera singer can, that, that performed the, at the Super Bowl, which is huge, right? Yeah. right. What, what I think is interesting is going to be how she sings. Right. <laughs> she, she, I mean, it's true. She she's done. Renee Fleming is very interesting as a as a musician. She's done all kinds of of stuff over the last couple of years, including collaborations with kind of indie rock musicians. And mm -hmm. she can she can sing uh, on on that on the more commercial end of the the temporal spectrum. Uh, and I and I wonder what she's going to do for a national television audience where she. Is I mean this is an opportunity for her as as a an individual artist and opera as a whole to either turn off seven billion people or 
really <laughs> intrigue a couple million. Yeah. Now let's just hope that this isn't another year where we have like a whole lip syncing scandal or anything. <laughs> I don't know. I, <laughs> I, I don't think she would agree to do a lip syncing version. No, no, exactly. I so that's think, one thing that we can look forward to not having any problem with. Just, yeah. Right. <laughs> Were there lip syncing things last year? Well, no, I mean, just. I guess with the Super Bowl in general, there's lots of things that can go wrong. I'm sure they've got a backup recording if um, something goes seriously wrong. Quickly, while we're on the subject, does anybody know who's doing the halftime show performance? I don't remember. I, I know I, I learned at one point, but I've forgotten. Okay. I apologize. I'm it's sure it's hard. nobody tough. that you care about. Yeah, tough right. to top Beyonce for sure. Right. So, yeah, that's now that I would pay to see is is Beyonce and Renee Fleming together doing the halftime show. Uh, I would pay extra for that. I would. I would as well. Uh, another way to reach out to a popular audience is, as we've discussed many times on the show, is social media. And mm -hmm. Twitter seems to be the the topic du jour for outreach things and uh the kurt vile festival is working on a project that they call tweet funny where they are going to put together a symphony as at least as they describe it on twitter it's very strange uh you go to tweetfunny.de and we'll have a link in the show notes and you use their their tool on the web to compose a tune it's not uh, open yet the site goes live february 28th uh so the the end of next month um, and you compose a tweet, and it somehow translates it into a Twitter message of 140 characters and then sends it uh, to composers and arrangers and orchestrators in, according to their site, that, that it's going to send it to composers in Berlin, Paris, and New York City because that's where anybody of any importance that knows anything about music or the arts lives is in yeah. one of those three cities. And if you don't, you're basically a country bumpkin, and you're going to enjoy listening yeah. to Kenny Chesney. No um, hayseed composers for them. Right. No serious music comes out of anywhere other than Berlin, Paris, or New York City. Um, but anyway, one of those serious composers will take your tweet, your tweeted melody thing that you create, and if it's good, they will generate a little short piece, a minute or less, of the project, and then... They will get a, a player in the orchestra at, at the at the Vile Festival to make an audio and video recording of it, and then they'll post it for everybody to see. So that site goes live February 28th, and then they will have a live concert of some of the best submissions on March 3rd. So uh, if you would like to say that you have had your music performed at the Kurt Vile Festival on your bio or in your CV, then... Check out, make sure you have a Twitter account and and watch tweetfunny.de on February 28th. What do you guys think of the tweetfunny? We, we should send one from the Sound Notion Twitter account. Yeah, we've said yeah. that before. Yeah, yeah, well. <laughs> well, we'll see if it happens. I mean, I don't know. I don't, it seems like a stupid restraint. Like, you have to use our tool, and then our tool is going to translate the thing that you make into Twitter, a 140 character tweet thing. And then it's going to be back translated for these other people in this other format. It seems like a stupid roundabout thing just to say that they're using Twitter. It doesn't like it doesn't actually need to involve Twitter. You, you could just make a short thing and send it to them. Yeah, but, it, but they're, they're yeah. hoping they'll. I mean, get then increased. it's not cool, and you don't get to put the little Twitter blue bird thing on it. But yeah, you well, don't I get all these lovely puns too. Like you can make a. A twoon? Out of little twoons? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so. Well, I think that they're banking on getting more buy-in, like more casual buy-in, because all you have to do is, you know, have a Twitter account, and you can do it like sitting in a coffee shop on your phone. Mm -hmm. Where if you gave, if you gave people the the ability to do it in some other way, a you would get super involved, really complex things, and um, you wouldn't get as many people doing it. That's true. Exactly. That by simplifying it, they are they are definitely you know getting a very specific group of people. It's not an everybody kind of thing. If you're saying you have to write dots and lines and you have to have you know the the bones and and all this other stuff in your in your score, it just I don't know. It seems 
artificial. Well, sure. But, you know, if it works, if it gets people interested, I guess we'll see. If it if it, it well, I should if it gets people interested and it's good, <laughs> if it we'll ends see. up some art comes from this, then yeah. Well, I don't it doesn't even art with a capital A is a problematic construct for me, <laughs> but yeah, if it if enough. it gets people interested in feeling creative, more power to them. Um, the American Composers Forum has announced their finalists for their 2014 National Composition Contest. So congratulations to Michael Lorello, Todd LaRue, and Christina Warren. Each of them is going to be working on a new piece for So Percussion, which is awesome. Uh, Christina Warren was a Duke. Yeah? Awesome. Ah. awesome. <laughs> go Duke. And, and you know, there we go. So... I listened to some of their music on SoundCloud and stuff. They, these are some, these are some good composers. And and I, of the three, I just randomly selected a piece from each of them that I could find streaming. And Christina's were my favorite. She had some cool electric guitar stuff. Um, anyway, they each get to write a piece for So, and then So's going to premiere these works in July. And based on those performances, a, a winner will be selected. And then So Percussion's going to, you know. F- Take that that piece on in into their repertoire. They're a regular cool. Kronos Quartet. Pretty sweet. I know. Well, that's. I mean, Kronos was. I think the first or one of the first groups that did this, right? Maybe I'm imagining um, that. They've I mean, done this with with the... big time groups for the last few years. They've they've done it with Ace Blackbird, um, and and uh, spacing on the other people they've done it with. Maybe Ethel. Um, not sure, but they've they've done this with with different chamber groups before, and it's very cool. So uh, well, it's it's an interesting lineup of composers, uh, just based on the bio included on the new music box piece about them. Uh, Michael Lorello seems like a quote normal kind of composer who just writes music <laughs> for ensembles, and then Todd Larue says he a Los Angeles based composer who works with invented acoustic instruments, which yeah. seems to be perfect for so percussion. Yeah. And and then and Christina Warren is currently working on a PhD in com- composition and computer technologies. And as we know, uh, so is not afraid of technology and electronics. So yeah. really anxious to to see. Well, we we talked to we when we talked to the, the so guys, they they told us that you know one of the one of the the things that they end up having to do a lot of is a lot of technical stuff. One and then two, a, a, a lot of creating their own instruments and yeah. where yeah. they're they're you know basically sent off on their own by the composer who's not doing much more than describing the sounds that they're going <laughs> for and you right. know, figure it out yourself kids yeah um and the last thing we were going to mention today we'll, we'll we'll have more on the uh the acf composition stuff soon uh we're we're hoping to get some of these folks on the show to talk to them sometime um so stay tuned to that. And I've heard people say for the internet, stay tabbed. Is that stupid? That sounds yeah, stupid. That's interesting. Like keep that tab open? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> yeah, stay like tuned. never close our tab on. Got that? Never close our tab on your browser. You should <laughs> always have a sound notion tab Why can't open we just say stay tuned? Just in case. I don't <laughs> yeah. understand. Stay we're tuned not, has, stay, it has staying power. It does have staying I mean, power, but it, we're not like tuning radio frequencies anymore. Right, exactly. Well, There's no well, dial. There's plenty of things we say that are... That right, you're not adjusting your VCR tracking, is I think what we're saying. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, so that's Don't very cool. That we we, we yeah, hope right. to uh, we hope to to talk more about that project in the future uh, with with some of those composers and other people involved. Um, and the last thing we want to mention is we're 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 running up against our our uh, our hour goal that we usually try to stick under, and I think we're <laughs> going to make it this time. But okay. uh, we're to do that gonna gonna punt on this slate piece that has been getting a lot of attention this week because we think it, it deserves more than a, a two minute thing at the end of the show. Uh, but if you if you haven't caught this, Mark, I'm going to go with Van Hohenacker. Uh, it's late. I'm glad. I'm glad Actually, you did let's that ask, one day. Let's, let's ask. Uh, let's ask Verena. <laughs> How do you say that name? I am I don't actually think... not sure. Oh, we should invite Mark the on the show. Who wants to? Who wants to send Mark an email? Um, <laughs> he has a, a piece in Slate called "Requiem: Classical Music in America Is Dead." Period. Uh, he didn't write out the word period, but he did include a period. And I believe um, he did not. He did not. He, I believe the editor chose the title. Sure. I think he came 
so there was a, a response, I think. As from, is as is the the way these things work. Right. Was it New Music Box or someplace else? There someone have been a lot spoke, of proper someone, Discord. Andy Doe had a brilliant takedown of the piece. And if you needed another reason to subscribe to the proper Discord blog, this was it. Um, but I don't there there was there some discussion on New Music Box as well? I uh yes, Frank posted something. Okay. Um, just yesterday, I think. Which just says or that this ago. is a this is a hot topic that a lot of people have interest in. <laughs> right. I mean, we're, we there are books and blogs that are just about the topic of the, the, the death or not death of classical music. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's interesting when it gets into something like Slate, right? Because right. this is a popular publication. We're, it's, it's outside of our bubble of people that read one another's blogs about new music and classical music, right? There's, there's like a circle of... 15 or 20 web publications that all read one another and comment on one another's things. And then, whoa, there's somebody from outside that has a readership of more than 200 people that's commenting on classical music at all, uh, much less this, this hot topic of, of, of what its future is. So that's an interesting thing. And we've already spent more time talking about it than I said we were going to spend. But so, no, so we don't change that a, dial. Yeah, exactly. We haven't. You have. That's true. <laughs> it's entirely my fault we'll as talk about with this all next manner week. of things we will talk about it next week and I look forward to doing that so you have been teased you have been warned and you have been assigned homework <laughs> got it? got it yes. alright so uh, I think that's did, am I missing anything? did we hit all the things? well if we want to uh, highlight a piece of music we should shout out uh Verena's transcription of Mr. Tambourine Man by John Crigliano. Thank you. It's oh. actually going to be performed at Carnegie Hall. Awesome. Oh, oh, wow. Yes. Michigan State is doing it. Uh, they're doing oh. Crigliano oh. Circus Maximus and they're doing my transcription. When is it uh, coming to New York? February. Uh, uh, I'll have to open my calendar real quick. Oh, okay. I'll have to this catch that This is a good plug. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Imagine. I think, I think, twenty two February twenty two. <laughs> oh, okay. We've got some got some help from Verena's off screen producer. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> Stephen, come I'll over here. A... Tell, yeah, Steve, I wanna, tell, I wanna, tell him we said hello. I want a cameo from Stephen. I'll have a link to that. I'll so, have a link to that. I'll have a yeah. link to that show notes. That's wonderful. So definitely check that out. Uh, it's a it's a it's a great piece, obviously, by Corleano, and it's a really cool transcription. We heard it. Um, I think they they did it when when Corleano was when they did the big Corleano thing at MSU a couple of years ago, right? Um, yes. Well, I know they. they uh, oh wait, I don't know. If was it that. not was it not part of that big whole the Corleano Estrano, extravaganza? Uh, uh, residency is the word I was looking for. I know. I they... think it was just last semester. Oh, okay. Did. Oh no! Because yeah. he, he came back. They had another residency with him and John Mackey. Cool. Oh. Yeah, at the same time. Yeah, cool. I know they That's played Circus Maximus the time before, but yeah, this 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 will be quite a concert. To see if you, Carnegie if you Hall. live in New York and you haven't seen Circus Maximus, then you should do yourself a favor. Cause it is quite a circus. It's quite. <laughs> it's quite the. To the max. Yeah. Yes. And, and with with firearms and everything. Yeah. It's firearms and marching bands and. It's it's crazy. It's it's it, but I we should say that despite the fact that it includes some spectacular things, it is more than spectacle. It is yeah. I think a, a really interesting and compelling work of of art outside of the crazy spectacularity of shooting a gun. Right. And having a marching band march through the state. Sure. So, uh, Verena, thank you so much for joining us. It has been delightful speaking with you and we we appreciate you taking some time this morning. Thank you for having me. Uh, we'll have links to all of the, the great things that Verena is up to and all of the stories that we mentioned and all of the, the interesting columns that we mentioned. There's, there's been so much written about all of the topics that we've talked about today. Um, and Sam is the guy that puts that stuff together. Uh, and, and it's always delightful. And if you are in the habit of just subscribing to the podcast and not checking out the show notes, you should absolutely go to soundnotion.tv slash sn uh where you can find the show notes for this episode and all of our past episodes as well links to all the things that we talked about and even some backlinks to to give you some more background information on things that we may not have spent as much time talking about if you're curious about those things so definitely check that out 
Um, and, and thank you to Sam for doing those. You can also connect with us on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube. Uh, we'll often post some of these links before we talk about them on the show. If you would like to suggest something for us to talk about on the show, you can, you can tweet it or, or post it on our Facebook page. Use hashtag SN Weekly. Uh, and we'll, we always check that hashtag on Twitter and Facebook as we're putting the show together each week. So if you've got a story, just, just tweet it at us with that, that hashtag and we'll, and we'll see it. Um, so thank you to those people who are doing that. If you'd like to watch the show live and participate in the chat room, we stream the show at soundnotion.tv slash live. And we're watching the chat as we go for anybody that has any, any comments uh, that they'd like to share while we're actually in our conversation still. Uh, you can subscribe to this show and all our shows at Sound Ocean TV in the iTunes store. You can also now find us on Stitcher Radio if you're a Stitcher user uh, on your mobile device that dials up uh, podcasts and things uh, for you automatically as you're commuting. Um, it's like Pandora, but for talk. Um, so check that out if you're, if you're into this, the Stitcher situation. Uh, if you'd like to support our show, tell your friends. That's what I'm asking you to do this week. That is this week's call to action. Tell your friends how great Sound Notion is. We've got this show. We've got Patch In, our new a show about electronic music. We've got Streamers and Punches, our show about film music. Uh, they did a, a, a nice little um, roundup of the Oscar nominations on this this past show, and they'll they'll get in some some more specific reviews of that stuff next month. Um, and we've got uh, our another show that we we just kind of relaunched here on Sound Notion. Anthony Landman's All the Cool Parts great audio show check that out as well all that stuff is at soundnotion.tv sound notions introduction includes music by patrick gulo and video by tyler lepp thank you again so much for watching or listening to our show we really appreciate it and we will see you back next week justin bieber <laughs>